On September the 18th, 2014, the people of Scotland will vote on whether to become an independent country. But what does it really mean to be Scottish or British, or for that matter, English, Irish or Welsh? My name is Rosie Braw from The Economist, and with me to discuss this is Linda Colley, Professor of History at Princeton University and author of Acts of Union and Disunion. Welcome. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, Linda, um, can you tell us what you think has kept the Union together for so long? I think it's a mixture of things. Um, part of the reason was, of course, the coercive power of the English state, and it was, first of all, the English state, one of the most quickly centralised states in Europe. But subsequently, different factors came in. Um, one of them, crucially, was the Protestant Reformation uh, in the 16th century, this triumphs, if that's the word, in England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, and a common Protestantism is one of the reasons uh, that Scotland joins England and Wales in 1707 in another act of union. Uh, and of course there's also an element of accident. Scotland had taken over, as it were, England and Wales when uh, a Scottish king, uh, James, inherits the throne in 1603 after Elizabeth I dies. The other reason which really did shape how the UK evolved was recurrent war. This has been a very warlike state and the final act of union, which does not succeed, to put it mildly, is the Act of Union with Ireland in 1800, 1801, and that takes place right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, when London is terrified that France may use Ireland as a stepping off point for invading Britain itself. And war and empire help to keep this union together as do the profits of empire. In the 19th and early 20th century, Scots, Irish, Welsh, as well as English, uh, were getting a lot of profit in different ways from the empire, as well, of course, as paying for the empire. And which of the ties that, that have bound us together do you think are now loosening or, or losing, losing their resonance? Clearly, the empire has gone the profits and lure of empire have gone. Uh, many of the old identity stories, not just Islandhood, but certainly Protestantism, are far less powerful than they once were. And the EU is a challenge in all sorts of ways, as has often been said. Once the UK joined the EU, however reluctantly, uh, the Scots, the Welsh, the Northern Irish got an alternative centre of gravity from London. Um, and that's been very important, uh, I think, for uh, the growing power of Scottish nationalists. Uh, the fear that they, the, the expectation, the hope that they've got somewhere else to go to. They're not dependent on London, or so the argument goes, in the way that they have been traditionally. Let's talk about Scotland for a minute. Some people you talk to would say it's been 300 years of a largely happy marriage with the occasional argument. Others would say it's been 300 years of subjugation or, or something of that ilk. How, how would you, as a historian, depict that, that union? It's certainly not been uh, a union of subjugation in practical terms. Uh, if, if anything, um, you could argue, and certainly many frustrated English people have argued over the centuries that Scots, uh, ambitious Scots, have done disproportionately well out of the Union. Uh, they got a lot of jobs in the Empire, they got a lot of the economic benefit of the Empire with places like Glasgow and shipbuilding on the Clyde doing really, really well out of British global reach. All that said, of course, like the north of England, uh, large parts of Scotland have suffered from industrial decline, uh, which has made 
uh, parts of Scotland far less uh, important and confident in the Union than they were before. And also, of course, if you want to be a separate country, uh, you, you see things in a different way. Uh, when I went to Edinburgh last, uh, for the festival last summer, um, I had various Scots come up to me and say, well, you know, we, we are a colony. Uh, and historically, that's rubbish. The, Scotland has never been a colony. It was never conquered. Uh, it's never been in a situation analogous to Ireland with uh, people moving in and grabbing land. Um, but the fact that Scots, some Scots can think they're a colony suggests, of course, arrestedness and unhappiness with the status quo. And if people think that, they think that irrespective of the nuances of history. Linda, tell us why you wrote this book. The short and pithy answer is that I wrote the book because I was commissioned to do a radio series and so the book evolved out of that. The more mainstream and, and genuine reason is that I feel, I know, that these issues, issues of identity, certainly issues over the Scottish referendum, over the possible EU referendum, will be inundated with comment from journalists, politicians, professional pundits. And I do genuinely believe that it would help uh, to get more history into these discussions, because it's history not so much geography, in fact, that helps to explain the current shape of the UK and some of the fractures that are currently emerging. So I thought as a historian, um, I could add a different strand to what is going to be an increasingly frantic, but perhaps not always terribly well-informed debate. Linda Colley, thank you very much. Thank you. The Economist.